All right, guys, what's up? Less than a week away from the first game. The training camp stuff is starting to get a little bit, I don't want to say uninteresting, because everything that comes out of this team right now is interesting on some level, but I'm ready to see this team actually take the field. Uh, later today, I know there's a scrimmage game. I'm going to try to watch it online or something. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do there, but... Uh, I'm not going. I'm, I know I can't go, but uh, there is a scrimmage game later today. That's going to be interesting. Uh, if I can get some updates at least from it, I'll tell you guys what I know later. But uh, for now, for this video, let's just stick to what happened yesterday at training camp and what's happened with this team the last couple of days, really. So, uh, first... Same situation with Jamal Adams, same situation with Dwayne Brown. Getting a little bit uncomfortable. I really thought Jamal was going to be taken care of by now. I don't like Dwayne Brown just sitting there and getting irritated, but I, I continue to believe this is going to be taken care of before the season starts. So neither of those guys are practicing. We had a lot of other guys who weren't didn't practice today either, but I think some of them got the day off just because, and some of them are nursing very minor injuries like Kim Dietschy. Uh, Puna Ford got the day off, Rashad Penny, Ethan Posick, Cody Barton, and John Radigan. I think Barton and Radigan are both nursing minor injuries because they're not guys you would necessarily give a day off, but I don't think it's anything too big. Um, Alden Smith also, I believe, didn't practice yesterday. Pierre-Olivier Lestage, but we already knew about that one. And, of course, still Dwayne Eskridge, although Eskridge is making uh, good progress towards being able to come back. So... Um, Cedric Ogbwehi and Jamarco Jones did not finish practice yesterday, so they both got nicked up a little bit again. And with the Dwayne Brown situation kind of skulking around in the background, kind of not a great time to not have tackle depth. Stone Forsyth did make his way back, which was good, but uh, it, it, it almost feels like the stars are trying to tell us something about taking care of Dwayne Brown. And look, guys... I had some comments in my video talking about how we can't extend everybody who wants an extension, and that's obviously true, but this is a circumstance with Dwayne Brown where it makes sense why he would want some kind of security, so I believe that we should probably go ahead and pull the trigger on that one. But, um, yeah, I think that's about it in terms of injuries. Um, Ogboehi and Jones, they sound like they had relatively uh, minor dings but they are something to keep track of with Dwayne Brown still not practicing okay so the main highlight of the training camp session yesterday actually came in terms of a little bit of a altercation and this was not like what happened with the Giants last week or well yeah I guess now at this point last week where um it, it got really heated and really nasty, and it turned into something that was actually a problem. This was just a routine sort of heated moment between a couple of players. Metcalf threw the ball at Amadi, and I, I don't want to read anything into this in the negative. I, I think for the most part, having these occasional dust-ups is probably a positive thing. You do want to see this kind of thing every now and then to a certain extent. I will say Metcalf... Entering his third year now does need to get his emotions in check a little bit more than I saw from him his first two seasons. There were definitely some times where he ate a penalty that he didn't need to eat. There were definitely some times where it seemed like he was letting his emotions get the best of him. Um, uh, there was a uh, play last year at home against Arizona where it could have easily been a 15-yard penalty on him on a third down that would have taken us out of field goal range. Fortunately, they got the Arizona guy, I think it was uh, Kirkpatrick, for the 15-yarder, and that ended up turning into a touchdown on what would have been a fourth down coming up. So uh, that worked out for us, but I remember those like 10 seconds of when I didn't know who the flag was going to be on, and I remember thinking Metcalf might have just cost us a field goal, but it worked out, but I'm worried about that kind of stuff happening again. So anyway... Metcalf flung the ball at Ugo Amati, Blair didn't like it, Metcalf shoved Blair, and they had to be separated. So, I don't have a problem with stuff like this. Stuff like this happens from time to time in camp. It, it's not a bad thing. It was certainly the highlight of training camp yesterday for the most part, because you're going to notice something like that. But, uh, yeah, just, just the stuff that happens, and 
Hey, I appreciate Marquise Blair deciding to take on the role of the father for the secondary. Um, I may, hopefully that means something going forward. Obviously, it can't be Jamal. It would normally be Jamal, but Jamal's not on the field. But uh, I guess that's kind of interesting. Um, the other... Well, okay. The, 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 the dust stuff isn't really a positive. So the main positive that I took from training camp yesterday was more really good work from uh, Damian Lewis. Um, he was practicing against Miles Adams, which should be a matchup he can handle, but he had two wins in one-on-ones against Miles Adams. LJ Collier had a great win over Jake Curhan when he bull rushed him. So Brady Henderson kind of echoes what I've been saying for a while now. Collier should and looks like he will play inside more in 2021. So those guys, I'll talk more about them a little later in another video, but they look like they're doing their thing so far. Um, the only other thing that's really worth talking about is that Nick Ballore got to play a little linebacker yesterday because Barton and Radigan were both out with minor injuries. Uh, I think Barton's going to be out a couple more days. Ballore has played linebacker before. He This is not something brand new to him, but he did make one play that got Aaron Curry very excited Made, I, I think it was a, a tackle in the backfield or a breakup in the backfield on Gerald Everett. Um, this is obviously not anything to really care about. The odds of Bellore ever having to take the field as a linebacker this year is low. And it would actually be kind of a disaster if that happened because that would mean like three people got hurt in front of him. But um, it is good to know that we have players who can do more than one thing. It is good to know that... He has some skills at the linebacker position, and it's kind of cool to see stuff like this every now and then. I, for all we know, I, I remember theorizing about this um, over a year ago. Cody Barton might not be long for the NFL. He might retire young because maybe he finds out the NFL level of the game is not for him. Uh, we, we saw that happen with that one Niners linebacker. I think it was uh, Chris Borland or Al Borland or whatever his name was. He retired after one season, even though he had a good rookie year because he was like, this game's just not for me. I've. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what causes a player to think that after spending some time in the NFL, but I always kind of felt like it could come from Barton. So, kind of useful, kind of cool. Um, that's about it in terms of what actually happened on the field yesterday. So, I'm going to close this video out by spending a little bit of time talking about something that I heard from one of our key offensive players and talking about what it means to me and how I think we might see that manifest itself on, in on-field performance in uh, 2021. So this is Tyler Lockett. I think he actually said this two days ago, but uh, he was asked about some of the Shane Waldron stuff, some of the new stuff we would be doing with a new offensive coordinator and Brady Henderson reported his reply in this in this way. Um, we plan to go up-tempo more under Waldron. Lockett said one difference is that Wilson will have 40 to 50 plays to choose from in our two-minute offense as opposed to 15. That means less predictability. <clears throat> it also means more for receivers to learn in terms of terminology and signals. It's very fast, Lockett said, but it's only going to be as fast as we are able to really pick up on it. So few thoughts on <clears throat> what Lockett says here. So first, th hearing this should make you very happy because this is something that very clearly needed to happen. This is an increase in the number of two-minute offense plays that this offense can run by, you know, three times as many plays, basically. We go from 15 to about 45, so that is something that really needed to happen. So we should be happy about that. That's the kind of thing that will make this offense more effective, especially because we're going up-tempo more. <clears throat> we've talked before. I think a lot of fan bases say this kind of stuff. We, we've said before, the Seahawks should just go no huddle all the time because they move the ball great when they're doing no huddle. Big reason why teams don't do that is because, one, your offense gets tired, but number two, maybe part of the problem was we didn't have enough plays. We didn't want to run the same 15 plays over and over again all game long. So we had 15 or so plays in that two-minute offense. And we only felt like we could use that in certain situations. So 
now we have three times as many plays. Reading this also kind of made me mad that our two-minute offense was so remedial during the Schottenheimer era, because I'm assuming this was talking about the Schottenheimer era when he said years past. Um, Wilson was in the prime of his career. Over the last three years, he had three phenomenal seasons. He was middle-aged for a NFL quarterback. He had plenty of experience under his belt. He should have been running a more complex, intricate, and less predictable offense during that entire Schottenheimer era. So reading this definitely made me mad too because it really highlights what we weren't doing with Schottenheimer that we should have been doing. Really makes the whole situation just look bad that we kept him around for a year, much less three. But the fact that Lockett is saying this, I think, is... Another indicator that we as fans need to be patient with this offense, and I've said this before, I'm not saying anything new, but when the offense takes the field in a month for the regular season games, if we see the offense not playing that great to start, then we have to keep things like this in mind. They're trying to learn three times as many plays for these up-tempo situations compared to previous years. Things have gotten way more complicated. And as Luckett says, it's only going to be as fast as we are able to really pick up on it. And he says this publicly. He's not just blowing sunshine and rainbows in public. He's actually saying like, yeah, this is going to be great, but we're going to have to learn it. So this should really hammer home the fact that if you are going to be a fan of having a more complex up-tempo offense, then you need to be willing to live with the results of picking up that new offense, which is it might take half a season or three quarters of a season or maybe even a whole season to really figure it out. So, said it before, say it again, be patient with this offense when the season starts. And with that, I'm going to get out of here. Peace out, go Hawks. Keep an eye out for more videos later today. We'll see what happens. See y'all later.